I am very excited to get started with this next panel where we are going to talk about, I think one of the most important topics, something we've been hinting about all day, which is the next step to expanding school choice. And you know, a lot of that requires work from individuals, from parents, from stakeholders. So I'm happy to introduce uh, Paulette Habersetzer. She is the co-founder of the Academy of Snohomish and has served as its principal and head, minister, uh, head administrator since 2014. The project began with her desire to provide families and children with high quality, affordable Christian education that allows kids to thrive in pursuing their passions. So Paulette. Joining Paulette will be Erica Donalds, who was mentioned earlier. Erica is the founder of the Optima Foundation and serves as its president and chief executive officer. She is a professional with a passion for education and has offered her expertise in business, regulatory compliance, and finance to further help the expansion of high quality school choice options in Florida's public school system. She also, I wanna say, uh, after many uh, different appointments in 2018, was selected by Governor-elect Ron DeSantis to serve on his Transition Advisory Committee for Education and Workforce Development. And our moderator for this panel will be Laura Zork, someone who I hope we're all familiar with. So let's give Laura Zork, Paulette, and Erica another round of applause. So they put me in the hot spot right in the middle here. <laughs> oh my, oh my goodness. I, it hasn't been a fantastic day with all this information. Uh, I just took some mulch in my, my mind's, you know, about to explode with all this new information that I'm hearing. Every time I hear these indiv individuals speak, I always learn new things. So um, hopefully you got a lot out of that. But I think really for us now, the reason we're here, we've, we've heard, um, we know the problems, right? Um, we know the solutions, running for school board, uh, changing legislation, um, expanding school choice, but what's that next step? What does that look like? And so this next panel is really important for this entire group right here because I hope it plants a seed into your heart. Uh, maybe this is the next step for me. Um, I, how many in here are homeschooling right now? Raise your hand. How many of you wish you had a place that you could send your kids that was safe, right? From everything that's going on. Well, that's why this next panel is really important because um, it's an answer to that, but also it's, it's gonna have to take some action. But before we jump into the questions on um, how to start your own charter school and your own private school, I want the, the ladies to take a few minutes um, and I'll start with Erica. Erica is just been a dynamic, amazing mom in Florida. I've known you what, since 2012 or 13. Um, just fantastic mom. She's always been involved and, and uh, ran for school board, served. But I think this is important for us to learn that you might see us in this role right now, but we went on a journey to get to the place we are. And um, just like we, we started off, I envision each and every one of you to go on your own journey and be the leader in your own state and own community. But Erica, if you'll just start off and tell us a little bit more about you and how you, um, what inspired you to get involved and how you got to where you are right now. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This has been an awesome day. I'm so, so grateful that I, I made it here after travel woes last night. Maybe some of you are familiar with that these days. Um, but yeah, Lauren mentioned we met actually, I think before even that time, because that was uh, Florida Parents Against Common Core. Uh, when we first got involved in education and I'm a CPA, I've been in investment management most of my career, about 20 years. When one of my three boys, I have uh, now 18, 14 and 10, uh, but when math changed, I was like, what is this? 
I mean, this is not the math that got me where I am as a CFO of a, a multi-billion dollar investment management company. Uh, it's not the way I want my children to have to learn. So that kind of got me off the couch. Uh, but when it comes to the issues we're talking about today, and especially on this panel, school choice, I did what most of you and the, the people that you know uh, do for school choice. And that is, I told the realtor where I wanted to buy my house. You know, I drew a box around the school districts that I wanted my children to attend because I had looked and they were A's and that told me that they were going to do a great job with my kids. Right. Uh, so I paid a premium for that house thinking this is where my kids are going to go to school. And it worked out for a little while. And for my first child it was very easy. And my second one, same school, boy, same parents, same upbringing. And it didn't work. It just didn't work. And after meeting with school district personnel, guidance counselors, assistant principal, principal, teacher, I mean, exact quote, there's nothing else we can do for him. I mean, and I thought, but you're the public school. You're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to work with me until we figure this out. Um, but I finally got fed up and looked for a private school for him. Uh, I had to put it on a credit card at the time, and I certainly couldn't afford for three children to go to private school, just the one. So I had to pick which one, you know, needed it the most. And then I thought, man, how many other Darrens are out there uh, who are getting lost in the system, probably drugged, right? Because that's what they were telling me I needed to do that I refused to do, uh, who are, are not being served by the public schools. And how can I help those moms who may not be as tenacious as me meeting and looking at forms and all this uh, and may not have a way out for their kids? So that's what got me involved in helping to start a charter school in my community. And I really thought I'm one of a small set of parents who are unhappy with this A school district. And so I'm going to help start this charter school, which is with a classical charter school for this niche of parents that are unhappy. Um, but we found out when we were doing our information meetings and we had no money to spend on marketing, this was totally grassroots, that there were a lot more families out there than I thought. And we opened that school with 400 students and over 400 on a waiting list with virtually no marketing at all. And I thought, there's something bigger wrong here with our school district. That was back in 2014. And that's when I ran for school board and, and beat the incumbent and served on the school board for four years. Now, that's not what brought me here today so much as uh, the school board was not how I found to uh, make the best difference for kids. Unfortunately, I was in the minority. I hope many of you that are running are, are not or find a way to uh, be a little more effective in the minority. Um, but after serving one term, I decided I'm going to start my own school district. And I'm just going to go back to what I did with the charter schools and start schools and serve families and serve children and give these parents an option outside of their traditional public schools. And so that's from 2018 to today, what I've been doing, we're serving 3,000 students in three schools, opening two this fall, two next fall, and two the following. I uh, had to leave my uh, investment management job because this uh, volunteer work was getting in the way of my paying work. <laughs> um, but thankfully, I've been really blessed to be able to do this and wake up every day and do what I'm truly passionate about and help students and families because it's a national emergency. So I'm excited to share with you guys what we've been doing and how you can do it too. So amazing. See, we really do bring in the best, right? <laughs> Um, so Paula, I know you have a different journey and you have opened up your school in Washington state, um, but talk to us about your family and what led you to um, just being so frustrated that you've just had enough and, and you took that next step. Yes, well, for my family, uh, we had always been committed to Christian education. And um, so our, our kids were uh, in the K through 12 school. Um, I have four and um, that gets to be pretty spendy. Um, and so after several years in this um, expensive school, uh, it was not only the cost, but it was also there was limited opportunity for um, all of the things that they wanted to do. So when you have, when you have children, you know, four kids, they have diverse interests and typical private schools only have they have the typical things. They have the art, they have the music, they have, you know, these little slots of things and uh, of, of those, the other things that drive kids' passion, I guess, is kind of where that is, where I'm going with that. And um, 
my kids wanted some different things. And uh, even filling the schedule, I remember when my daughter was uh, um, her first uh, moving from elementary up to junior high, and she was so excited to get her junior high schedule. And she was like, hmm, study hall. Hmm. Okay. All right. And then she had like a, you know, a word, it was a Microsoft word class. And I was like, oh boy. Okay. And then my son wanted to do speech and debate. Um, they both were interested in music. Um, so uh, we had also, so my business partner and I, uh, my co-founder, Jody Pfeiffer, she was in a similar situation too, where she um, homeschooled some years um, and brought them to uh, the Christian school other years. And this is just like what Erica was saying. It is difficult for families to have um, a, the funds for all of their kids. Um, and so having to pick and choose or, you know, finagle around with your finances to try to figure out which kid you're going to serve. So that was, um, that was kind of the big driver for why we, what we wanted didn't exist. And we had each homeschooled for a year. I wanted my kitchen table back. Um, and <laughs> I'm not good at everything. I'm good at some things. Um, and, but I having to dig up what I remember about um, ninth grade algebra and that sort of a thing and try to teach it to my kids. Not so great. Um, and then I also at the time was, and I still have, I was operating a, a Christian preschool. And so three days a week, I had that in the morning. So trying to do that and be homeschool mom, um, I didn't have the option as in our community where they have, um, you can take your kids to different classes, but you have to be in Washington state. I don't know how it is uh, anywhere else, but in Washington state, you have to be on the campus the whole time. So if you've got four kids, good grief, I need my travel trailer to be there, you know, with me for <laughs> six hours that I'm sitting there with my knitting, which I don't knit, but all the moms do. But anyway, so, so when my friend and I got together and I said, you know, I, I'm thinking about this idea. I think, I, I, would you go on this journey with me? Uh, we liked what we liked about homeschooling. We definitely wanted Christian education and we wanted options and funds uh, to be able to, to get additional activities for our kids, learning opportunities, whether it was speech and debate or choir or martial arts or, and in areas of excellence, because at, at the point that we were in full-time Christian school, our finances were all tied up in one spot. And so it allowed us to, this model allowed us to diversify, make uh, something that was affordable. And we started, um, we started our school with 12 students, 12 or 15 students in my basement. That's where I started preschool years ago. And then we went back to the basement and started it. And um, those are called micro schools now, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but, the, but we, we found from that just creating that experience and that model that our students were, um, well, let me back up, K through 12, we've got a web-based component, we've got the traditional uh, Christian schooling feel, and it's in a, a brick and mortar building. So there were parts of the homeschool, you know, you want, there, I know and uh, that there is social. Homeschool students have this, you know, stigma that's like, oh, they need socialization because they don't talk to anybody. Well, you know, that's not true. Um, but for us, I, I liked the idea of being able to take the kids to school, have them there for a um, few hours in the morning to do their core subjects, and then I can be with them in the afternoon and do the homeschool things. And I, and, and I hope you learn from this that when you have an idea that create it the way that you, you're, you're inspired to create it. Because I think if it's something, if it's something that you know that you need, it more than likely it's what other parents are looking for too. But I, I do want to talk about the fact that, especially with us living in Florida, Eric, and I'm seeing this across the nation because last year we had sweeping legislation for school choice, right? We had charter bills that passed. We have um, expanded educational um, freedom. But one thing that we are finding is the fact that parents do want to exercise this option, but there's not any schools. There's the wait list. I know in Florida, um, I, and I looked it up through the Department of Ed, we have 125,000 parents on a wait list for charters. So, um, and that's the state with educational freedom. And I, I know this is the same path other states are going to go down, but we're going to get ahead of it because we're going to start opening up our own schools, charters and private. Um, but I, I want to learn from Erica with the charter that you started at Mason Academy, correct? And, and I want to hear about the, the new journey that you're on with um, 
opening up other charters. Is it the same? Um, is it the same group? The foundation I started is called the Optima Foundation, okay. and Optima is now opening our schools. Uh, the brick and mortar schools are affiliated with Hillsdale College, so we're utilizing their curriculum, which any one of you can use. If you have a private school or you homeschool or a charter school, you can apply to use their curriculum for free. Um, we also partner with them for teacher training and things like that. Um, but Optima, uh, we are also creating a virtual curriculum of our own uh, because Hillsdale doesn't do virtual curriculum and it's uh, delivered both virtually and also available for live learning in virtual reality, first in the world virtual reality school. So we're trying to, our mission is to make classical education available to every family. And we're doing that through classical charter schools, through the classical virtual and virtual reality schools. And um, we're also putting together a private private school um, option that's sort of like a charter or a private school in a box to help families and churches, especially who want to start their own schools to be able to do it. Um, and I think what you said is so great to do something that you're inspired to do. You were able to start something that you envision and customize it exactly how you want to see it done. And you're able to do that. And that's, that's an awesome form of school choice. And what we're doing and I encourage people who have that vision and that capacity to do it that way. What we're trying to do is, is put together scale, a scaled model where people who can't put something customized together, but want, they know they want classical education. They know they want another option. How can we help them to get that in a way that they know is a reliable, excellent option that's put together with policies, procedures, and everything kind of ready to go. And the Hillsdale's kind of helping people to do that as well. So there's, there's multiple ways that people want to grab onto to do it. And I think both of these are, are great options that you can show the differentiation of, of different ways that we can expand school choice. So when, when we're looking at this, and I'm going to ask for both of you the same question, what is the first step that someone would need to take if they're looking at opening up a charter, or opening up a, a private school? What are those first steps they need to consider? So if you were looking to Optima, for, for instance, to help you, you might partner with Optima or a similar type of organization, charter management organization, to help you open a school. We've already done it multiple times. We already have a, a way of doing it. We have all of the, the policies written. We have the way we finance things. We build a building. And when we partner with groups in communities, they perform the grassroots uh, part and we perform the business, the government relations, we write the application and all of that. And that's how we get together and do a school together. Um, but there's very little control, you know, by that group over how we do things. It's like you visit our school, if you like it, you can help us bring it to your community. Um, on the other hand, we started a charter school and we didn't have a system in place. The first one that I helped to start, we were just a group of parents volunteering. Um, there was a couple that wrote the charter with some help from Hillsdale. And we looked for a place to lease a little bit of space. And we went out and, and we crafted that school in what we envisioned. And you could do it either way. You could partner with an organization like ours and do it that way. Or you can put a team together sort of it sounds like what you did. You need someone who knows numbers. You need someone who can write. You need an educator who can help with curriculum. Put your team together, go out there, look at what the typical charter school law or the charter application looks like, start divvying out responsibilities, go out and raise some money and you know, try to get a little bit of space and do it small to big. You can do it either way. If we did it, knowing absolutely nothing, if you did it, Anybody can do it. I'm not an educator. I'm a business person, but I, we put our team together of parents and we had a little bit of everything in there and we cobbled it together. Let me tell you, you won't do worse than the traditional public schools are doing. Okay. They're doing a horrible job. All right. So get your dream team together of your neighbors and your friends and decide how you're going to do it, whether you're going to partner or whether you're going to do it from the ground up, but you can do it if you want to. Fantastic. Paula, in starting a private school, what were your first steps? Yes, that's 100% true. You can do it. And the drive is, well, most, our, most of us are moms that are doing this and the things that you'll do for your kids. Um, the joke in my house, when my daughter, my, my third daughter graduated in her graduation speech, she said, my mom would rather start a school than have homeschooled us. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true because you play to your strengths, you know? 
And, um, and so that was really for, for me, that, that is what drove, it was my kids um, and getting together and, and what Erica's talking about for us, we're actually, we're kind of right on the coattails of what you're doing right now. Um, that we now seven years down the road are, um, we went from my 12 little people basement and two teachers to um, next year, 155 students and a staff of 20. And our model is unique in that what we say is our market is actually, if, if, if you're someone who likes the idea of homeschooling, um, but you can't really see yourself taking it all on um, alone, especially with the way that um, things are bleeding out in the public schools and in Washington state, whew, let me tell you. Um, yes, what anything you had here said here, multiply that by six, I mean, it's, it's not good. But that has caused a huge influx into our school. Um, and then really parents, couple of things, um, parents who want to uh, like the idea of homeschooling, don't feel equipped, particularly when you're getting into high school and being worried about, am I gonna meet all the requirements? Am I gonna be able to do all the things and know that they're gonna be okay and prepared to graduate and to go wherever they want to go? So we're providing oversight with that. Um, but also what's unique is the part where it's not what we say about our model. It's not a full-time drop-off Christian school. It's there's, we, I say sweat equity, um, that parents are coming alongside and supporting it. The academy is um, providing the academic rigor and framework and that they're on track. Parents are holding their kids accountable and being involved in their education and then being willy, willing to, be taxi drivers and drive them wherever they want to go to compete in these other things or learn these other um, activities that are high quality outside the classroom, um, and and that's been that's been kind of the magic of of that process. But anyway, so we are creating the intellectual property and all of that uh, as well, and then it's definitely a scalable um, model too. And it can start. We've gone back to say, well, okay, what about the basement? What do you need? You need an administrator. You need an administrator who um, has a vision, um, an administrator who yeah, certainly there's a ministry aspect. I mean, I made two cents an hour uh, <laughs> for the early years. And, um, but the time that I got with my kids, that's the other thing is that, that because of those shortened school days, I didn't, we didn't, my business partner and I, we didn't want our kids in school all day. We wanted to be with them. And so there you have the homeschool aspect, you know? Um, so the administrator is important, the building, it could be your basement. Um, it could be a church. If you get into a church, then you're, that's already got, and, and they're willing to open their doors right now to plant a school. And then that's easy. And then we've got all the things it's, it's funny. I refer to this as a school in a box too. You add a little water and some students and you're, where you go. Oh my goodness. Well, I know you make it seem so easy, but you know, as, um, as someone that is really considering this <laughs> myself for my kids, because I, I have between my uh, three that are in public school and then I have three grandchildren, I'm like, I got six right there I could start a school with. But um, so when you talk about put your team together, you know, that's great. But then I think about what are those startup costs that we have to consider? And um, like, yes, let's put our team together. But what do you all see as the, the parts and pieces of the startup costs that we also need to consider? Because to me, when I talk to my husband about this, it's always, um, he's always, how much is this going to cost? What do we need? And I said, I don't know. I'm waiting to find one of those uh, uh, boxes that we could just pull from. <laughs> so anyways, I'd like to hear from both of you on that. Yeah, I, I think. You can do it on almost any budget if you have enough volunteers um, and enough people to contribute uh, their sweat equity. When we start a new school, if you are partnering with us, we try to raise about a billion dollars to plant a new school. Now, this means we're opening a school that is uh, 70,000 square feet, a brand new building, um, starting with 750 kids in communities like Naples and Jacksonville and Martin County and Stewart, um, where we know that there's enough demand to meet that. If we can raise a million dollars, either in donations or in loans, uh, which is actually how we finance most of our schools. If someone in that community is sympathetic to the cause, and many are even more now aware of the problems in our, our schools, and they might be willing or able to write a $20,000 check or a $10,000 check, I would say 
you know what, can you just loan us a hundred thousand instead? We'll pay you a nice interest rate. We have a track record of paying back these loans. And that's how we uh, make our way to a million dollars. Um, if you were doing the same thing on a smaller scale, you might be able to do it with around 500,000, but that's at the scale that we're doing. Um, we've seen school schools do it on a couple hundred thousand over time. Um, but what we do, the reason why we need a million dollars, we have a principal start a year ahead of time. We're doing major marketing. Um, we're purchasing 750 kids worth of furniture and materials ahead of the school opening because a charter school doesn't get paid until it's open. Um, and I, I hate to throw out that million dollars because it sounds like such a huge amount of money. It did to me when I first got started, like how would I ever raise that much money? Um, but you would just be surprised. Like when you start off, I um, remember the first fundraising campaign I ever did with my husband, the first time he ever ran for office. And I think we raised like $4,000 at this breakfast. And we were just like, oh my gosh, like we, 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 we thought we were amazing. Like it was the hardest $4,000 that you ever, um, raised. And, and today, like that's nothing to raise it because we've just come a long way in, in our ability to, to raise money. So you have to start somewhere and, um, it, and you can do it. You can get there. It may take longer than you'd like. It takes longer than all of us like, right? We want to be able to go, where's that, you know, angel investor to give me a hundred million. I can do all these schools at once. Um, but you just have to start somewhere. And like I told a lot of these candidates, you know, export your phone list, put a number by every single name, call every single person, you know, and just ask them to do a favor and give you money. It, it doesn't matter if they believe in what you're doing. They believe in you. So they'll give you $20, $100, $50. And that's how you get started and just start raising it from there. So I, and a um, million dollars, I'm not going to tell my husband that, but, <laughs> but I think, um, I think you might have a little different budget that you were looking at. And, and, and I know Erica's vision it, it's amazing. I, I hope if you were able ever to get to Florida that you could visit one of these schools. It's just amazing. But let's let's talk about your budget. Yes, my budget is different, a little bit different. I got a different story, and um, and I started. Sorry, there's so much so much things to say to you all. But um, when you talked about the team, I got as far as the administrator, and then one other person who will get on your bus and say, "Okay, I'll go where you're going." Um, and for us, the startup was, and I'm a person who, when I see something and I'm like, okay, I need to get this done. Let's go. So how long is this going to be a couple of months? Um, and from when we started from, we, we say my friend Jody and I say, when we were sitting on the couch in my living room, we went from that couch in the spring to the school opening in September. And so that's kind of my timeline kind of a thing. Um, and so right now, even our, we're, we're um, moving toward our first satellite um, location, and this is a pilot. We're working out the bugs with this one, and uh, we're talking about it right now, and we're looking to open it in September. And so our budget looks like um, if you, you have the consideration of the space, if you have your own space, um, and people are renovating all kinds of different things and stuff, that's a big help. Um, our startup was like between ten and eleven thousand dollars. Yeah, you've got so it and it's much smaller, of course. And our model actually is more of of plants where we're meeting the need where there's that we can have quick startups all over the area, and then we can kind of create a network of schools that can kind of share resources and 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 activities and stuff that we can share between each other and even staffing and that sort of thing. So, to start grades three through twelve. Um, Ten or eleven thousand dollars. If you um, if you want to add a K through two program, because that of course in our um, model is not web based, it's more of a hands on feel, but it still mir mirrors what the overall school mission is. It's Monday through Thursday, eight thirty to noon. Um, we have Fridays as a work for, from home day, so you have a lot more time in your schedule as a family to do family things and to be together. Um, so for that, if you've got your, um, our tuition funds are your two big things are your salaries and your building that's, and then of course there's insurance and internet and that sort of a thing. Um, but we can make do with a lot less 
and it's a pretty quick process. If you get into a church, well, then you've got, that's a, that's a lot easier situation because you have that umbrella uh, over you and you've got in, insurance um, covered and some of those things and uh, having a church um, backing and, um, you know, providing a, a space is helpful, but we didn't have any other, we took no money from anyone else except for my husband. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna need $10,000 real quick. Um, and at that point I didn't know, I just said some money. Um, and, and, but with what, everything that we were paying in Christian right. education, yeah. you know, and then we added up our little things, forget out our tuition. And then now moving forward where we, all the things that we didn't have starting up, like what you were talking about, Erica, all the policies and the admission things and tuition collection and management. And, um, some of the things that we wish we had known that we didn't know, we've got that for our other clients well i know this this is going re really fast the time but for this group here what is the best piece of advice you could give them if they are considering opening up their own school or working with a, a group like yours erica to get started what's what's that best piece of advice you'd like to give them to start just do it. Take the first step, get somebody else that's going to go with you, just at least one other person like right away. Um, so it's not just an idea in your head, but you have that accountability with one other person and say, we're going to do this. And just know that you're not going to give up no matter what roadblocks come, because they are going to come at you like meteors, um, you know, from all directions and, and pray. That's the biggest piece of advice. I mean, I couldn't have done any of this if God wasn't opening these doors and blocking and tackling for me and, and for all of us that are on this team. Um, so yeah, get somebody who's accountable with you and just take those next steps and, and start moving towards it no matter how long it takes. It's frustrating because this is awesome. You can do it quickly, um, just like she said, and it could be amazing for your kids um, on that scale. And a lot of families are looking at doing something very quickly because their kids don't have another chance at first grade, another chance at um, third grade or whatever. And ours take two years to open. I mean, if you told me today you wanted school, your school would be opening in 2024. That's just the timeline because there's bureaucracy, there's funding, there's all of these things. Um, so there's a multiple ways to go about it, but just start taking those steps, get something down on paper, be accountable to someone and put it in God's hands. Well, my response would be definitely, um, and I touched on it a minute, is um, with people that you're um, starting with, there needs to be uh, an aspect of ministry that they're really willing to just put it all out there and go for it no matter. And, and in your, in your circle of people that you bring on board, I mean, you know, when I meet you, I'll, you know, we'll talk a couple minutes and I'll, and I'll say, so what do you do? Well, I have this skill or that skill. And I think, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'll make note of that. And so you're going and you're doing that and you're pulling people in. And as with our program, that's a web-based program, we don't have to have, we have teacher facilitators. So you can look at people who um, are great with kids or love education. They don't have to be certified teachers. Um, but but they can be effective in the classroom. Um, so looking around with with who you have in your network and what is their skill set, um, and then like Erica said, um, pray for sure, pray and watch out for the enemy. Anytime you're doing anything worthwhile, especially when you're talking about impacting families and um, students and families. Um, and even now more than ever coming out of the public school, whether it's just like right now, families are getting out and are looking for options. And in our neck of the woods, there's a, the schools are full. The Christian schools are full. So there's just a need for right now. Anytime you're having that kind of an impact on um, people and souls, the enemy is on the move. Yes, very much. And so, um, and then just keep going. Okay. Well, that is amazing. And, um, and I hope that, uh, and I, I've talked to a few of the few of you in here, and I know that has come up over the last year in some conversations. So I think this um, panel is very timely. We have, um, we have time for a couple of questions. We'll try to keep them rapid. And uh, we'll start with Tracy. Wonderful timing on my part. Um, we have a grassroots effort in Ohio. There's six of us in a, our leaders group. And that's what we've been talking about over the last few months is starting a charter school. So we're just 
we've got some people that are looking into it, getting all the stuff. So when you both started talking, it was like, oh, <laughs> so if you don't mind, I'd like to reach out to both of you and just maybe pick your brains and see if like, if we're in Ohio, I know you're in Florida, where are you at? Washington, Washington that's right. Okay. Yeah. I, if it's okay, I'd like to just reach out to both of you and yeah. And you can get my, my email is Erica at optimaed.org. So, okay. and Erica with a K, no C. And we're definitely looking at the classical too. Erica, E-R-I-K-A at optimaed.org or optimaed.org. You can get me through there. And I love to help people everywhere. We can't do a school for everyone, but I always just provide, you know, consulting, free advice. Yeah, that, we do a monthly Zoom for anyone who's looking to start schools that were not in their area mm -hmm. just so that they can share information and, and get advice from us. Yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I'm just wondering about unionization. Are you worried about that with your teachers? Thankfully, no, because in Florida, charter schools do not have to be unionized. I know there are some states where charter schools have to use union teachers. We thankfully do not. I will not be going to those states until that changes. Um, but I, I have other ideas about unions, as Laura knows. Um, one of the questions that you should be asking your school board candidates and that you school board candidates should be thinking about is paycheck protection. Um, I've been asking every school board candidate if you have a majority of a school board, you can do paycheck protection in your own school district, which means that the, the union dues have to be taken outside of the paychecks. The district doesn't collect the union dues on their behalf. Um, and if teachers have to start writing that check or taking action to pay those dues, it's really going to affect their membership. Um, so I would just encourage that to be part of all of your platforms, just to keep weakening the power of the unions in your states and in your districts uh, to stop subsidizing uh, unions by taking the dues on their behalf. I have a question. Um, I'm wanting to help my church start a school and I'm a former kindergarten and first grade teacher. And so I, you know, and I've already picked curriculum that I think it's going to be excellent. It's a um, I, my, my daughter's homeschool and uh, told me about it. it's uh, my father's world. It's a uh, classical I don't know what any of you know about it, but I'm also going to the homeschool convention next week. But my question is, we have the building um, and, you know, I can do teacher training um, and we're thinking it being an all day type of situation because of for pe most people in my church, you know, they have to work. And so um, my only question is, uh, I know in Florida, you can get funds from the state, you know, that come, uh, you know, from scholarship and everything, but I think you already have to be established for, I don't know what period of time, but I'm just wondering, I think our only obstacle would be getting money the first year because I don't think everybody could afford the tuition and we would have to pay teachers. So I, my biggest thing is how do we pay the teachers? How do you get that money to you know, to start out doing that the first year, because we want to start, I want to start now. I'm, you know, I'm chomping at the bit to start, but the money is an, an obstacle. Yeah, I, I hope I can speak intelligently about that in a few weeks. We're actually going through the process right now to qualify for those scholarships. Randy Fine mentioned it earlier, Representative Fine, um, that 91% of children qualify for the scholarships. One, families don't know that they qualify. Two, we don't have enough private schools that are qualified that are taking the scholarships. So the fact that in the ether, these people are allowed to have scholarships means nothing for students who can't access them and, and with no seats available. So that's part of our effort with the churches is to establish a school that gets the scholarships that we can just plant multiple campuses around the state and have that whole financial thing worked out for the churches so that we can collect the money and fund them. Um, but it, it does, it is a bureaucratic process like anything um, with government funding. So we're trying to figure that out. So if you wrote down my email address, please email me and I will let you know what that looks like. A uh, question is about uh, certified teachers. Do you, I'm sure you probably have certified teachers because you're on a larger scale, right? Unfortunately, yes. Okay. And then say, for instance, I want to start this grassroots in Texas. We're going to try to, to separate from TASB or something. We want a group of parents. I know a ton of parents who want to uh, go to Christian school. Schools are full. Homeschool, they can't do it. So if this were an option, 
would I need to obtain, would I need to wor work on getting teachers that are certified? And if teachers are certified, or if you can speak to this, and if, and if, like, what would that require on, you know, like, and, and also another thing is everyone's so concerned with how is this going to reflect in college and so forth. That's a major, you know, I already know that that's a, uh, that's going to be an issue. So can you talk to that? I can. So uh, certified teachers. So in our model, it hasn't been an issue. It's more qualified, qualified individuals. And, and when we were first getting started, it wasn't critical um, because of the web-based component, the K through two program, as I said, that's different, but still that's younger grades. And there's, you're, you can find people who are capable to teach in that program. You need two or three teachers, two teachers starting up for K2, but um, so this, um, as, as things have continued to get worse in the public schools, now we've gained public, uh, we've gained certified teachers, which the biggest thing that's been helpful is that uh, the classroom management, some of the things that just teachers know that are season, the seasoned teachers that they bring to the table. Um, but because of the, we're, because of, we are a non-approved, non-accredited by choice, Christian school hybrid, where we can kind of ride the line wherever, if we want to be homeschool, we want to be Christian school, both of those things. So we don't have requirements on us regarding teachers, regarding even how many hours in the school day that kids need to be, because then it's homeschool. Now, as far as college, you asked about that. That was one of the early questions that I asked a college counselor in my area. I said, is, is this going to be, um, are my kids going to be limited in any way? Because my business partner and I, our kids were the guinea pigs. So I said, will they be limited in any way for college admission? And no, she said, colleges, they don't care what, where you're coming from or whether the school is accredited or not, they can, they can get in. Um, and so at this point, we've had a handful of um, graduates. We've gotten a 1.1 million in scholarship awards for our students who have graduated. We had them apply to multiple schools across the country. Um, and so they've gotten uh, up to maybe 127,000, I think, um, was our one this year that, and Catholic University of America was one, Carroll College, um, Biola, Gonzaga, UW um, Chem program, um, and a host of others. Up until this point, it has not been an issue, but I had a phone call earlier in the week with Liberty University, and I called, and um, at, at the other thing that I do is forge relationships with um, college admission um, uh, counselors across the U.S., and I've hosted college uh, fairs and that. Admission counselors love to talk to us, and they love to hear from our kids. Our kids are competing in all kinds of things and doing well, and then they told me that if you're an unaccredited school, they will not allow your student, but they still admit homeschool students. So I'm thinking, where is the, what's the thinking behind that policy? I don't understand that. Um, I can understand if, if you said we're not taking homeschool st students either, but they don't have any um, requirements for them at all. And we're the ones that are offering some governance over this, some standardization um, and a fair representation of what the students' abilities are. Um, so if you have spare time, I would love it if you would call the admissions department at Liberty and ask them about that because I talked to them and I said, this is, in this climate, this is a bad policy to roll out right now. And you, I have your people. And I said, I'm not advocating so much for my students, but I'm, or, or for my school, I'm advocating for my students. I think that's going to change too, as things evolve with micro schools and blended learning and all of that. Our virtual program that we're launching this fall is accredited, but for that same reason, it's available privately across the country, publicly in Florida. So Florida residents get it for free. Um, but one of the major questions that we get when we're talking to families or schools outside of Florida to use the curriculum is, is it accredited so that they can get credit uh, for these, these courses. And we run into those same types of issues, um, but I can't, uh, help the opportunity to talk about teacher certification because uh, conservatives are, are big teacher certification supporters for some reason. And I do not support teacher certification. If you're advocating at the state level for school choice policies, uh, don't let them compromise on teacher certification. It is a total scam. Um, so it is a huge barrier to entry for teachers. I mean, we just heard from this incredible woman, um, Tara, who it would not be able to teach in Florida, her son or any other children because she's not certified. Now, how ridiculous is that? That all of these amazing moms who get their children from K to 12 and into some of the best colleges and doing the best cannot teach in our schools. 
absolutely absurd. So teacher certification is a huge pet peeve of mine. One, because it's a scam and it's a, a union um, monopolization tactic. And two, because conservatives somehow think that increases quality of teachers when it absolutely does not. And we should allow professionals, uh, education leaders to select people based on their qualifications and not their certification and that barrier to entry. So. All right. Well, I love this. That was a great way to end this um, panel. Good. Aren't they amazing? Yes. But I hope it inspires you that um, if these two ladies, they're fantastic, but you are too. So let, let's get to work on this because I know it's needed.